Let's open our Bibles to 1 John chapter 2, please. 1 John chapter 2, and I've got to get down to my third week. Here we go. He says, chapter 2, verse 1, he says, My little children, these things I write to you that you not, may not sin. But if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He himself is the propitiation for our sins. Careful how you say that. And not ours only, but also all those who love, or also the, for the whole world. I don't know about you, but I just want to stop and just, I just enjoyed that worship this morning, didn't you? Just enjoyed that worship this morning. I just like, I think our worship team will be, when, when you all get raptured, uh, our worship team will go first because they'll set up and be the worship leaders in heaven. You think I'm kidding, I got an inside to God, so... Uh, anyway, so Jesus is the propitiation. First John chapter four verse ten says, "This is the love that we that not that, or this is love, not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins." The word propitiation literally means that you've been vindicated in the eyes of God. When you see that word vindicated, it doesn't just mean that your penalty has been paid. And I love this. If you get a hold of this, it doesn't just mean that the price for sin has been paid in your life. It doesn't just mean that. It means more than that. It means not only has the price been paid, but that you've been declared not, not guilty, but innocent of your crime also. Innocent of the sin. It's that because you're a new creature in Christ, you're innocent of the sin. Now, we know that the old man did all that stuff, and he knows that the old man, but he crucified you in Christ. Jesus became the propitiation for our sin, and we stand before God not as a, not as a sinner who sinned, but as the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. If you ever get a hold of that, man, I'll tell you, so many people don't get a hold of that. We have this whole dichotomy, if you will, of our brains going back and forth to, I'm a sinner, I'm a saint, I'm a sinner, and I've got all this stuff going on. And we, we almost, it's almost like in churches, we almost like to um, enjoy and tout our failures rather than our successes. We almost like to tell people, it's like somehow if we get up and say, you know, I'm just no good filthy sinner, we go, that's right, brother, amen, amen. But if we say, I'm the righteousness of God in Christ, he says, now that's arrogance, that's arrogance. But really, that's not arrogance, that's Bible. Because if you keep telling somebody you're a sinner, you're gonna, you're gonna sin. But if you keep telling people they're the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, and that they're born again, and Jesus has paid the price for our sin, and, and that word propitiation literally almost means it's, it comes to this connotation that not only have we been eradicated or vindicated from our sin, but it's though, it's though Jesus himself, because the sin of the world was laid on him, it's, like, it's though he became the guilty party in the situation. You understand he wasn't guilty, he was lived a sinless life, but that's what's so cool about it is our sin was laid upon him, and it's, though, it's as though the guilty, that he became the guilty party because the sin of the world was laid upon him. That's why 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone's in Christ, he's a new creature, re creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. Verse 21 of the same chapter, he says, For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And I was thinking about it as I was preparing this message, and I was thinking about the the, the, the thought process that goes through in, in Romans chapter 5 and verse 17, and this is really what we teach here at Faith Center. This is what we believe. This is what we go for. This is what we expect. Is sec, or Romans 5, 17 says, For if by one man's offense death reigned through the one, much more those who receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign in life through one Jesus Christ. So I'm just kind of passing in review briefly and adding just a little bit that we didn't talk about before we get into our thought process today. But I want you to see this verse. Therese and I, this is our life's verse. We both made this our life's verse. I don't know how we really ended up with it. Other than we just walk in this verse and, and in our family room, if you walk in the front door, we have kind of an open staircase. You walk into where the, and the, the right side, the right side is the, li the living room. And then you go straight. And then when you walk into the kitchen and then the family room, there's a big wall right here, and on the wall, this verse is, is painted on our wall. We shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. Romans, 
He says, we shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. And we've really built our lives around this verse of reigning in life by one Jesus Christ. So let me just break this verse down. And again, I haven't even got into what I want to talk to you today about it, but I just want you to see something. Number one, he says, if by one man's offense, death reigned through the one, we know that that's Adam who sold us out. And it's kind of interesting. I've always thought it was kind of unfair that Adam got to represent me. Did, did you ever think that way? It's like, it seems unfair that Adam got to represent me. It's like, come on, man. I, give, I want my shot in the garden. You know, maybe I could turn mankind around, but I, it's not fair. But it's, in, but, it's, but it's brilliant when you think about it. Because he invested everything in Adam because he invested in one man to carry the weight. And if this guy blew it, then there'd have to be a redeemer. But if, it, if everybody got their shot, then for everybody that took their shot, they'd have, have one man per person to redeem them. So, so he invested everything in Adam so that he could invest everything in Jesus. It's a brilliant, brilliant plan. But so Adam blows it, he brings sin upon the world, but then he says this, he says, he says, those who receive, now you can't earn, when, when you receive something, you can't earn that. It's, it's a gift to you. And the two things he talks about here is, he says, you've received the abundance of grace, it's a gift, you can't earn that. And a lot of Christians try to earn that by, you know, you can't give enough, you can't witness enough, you can't do, all, you can't do enough for God to 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 warrant his gift of grace. Gift of grace means favor. It's unmerited favor that's upon your life. And then he says, then there's the gift of righteousness. Favor, grace is a, is a, a position of favor wherever we go. There's unmerited favor that God pours out on us. But then righteousness is a different thing. Righteousness is not holiness. Holiness is an act. Righteousness is a position that was given to you as a gift. It's a gift from God that, completes your salvation and makes you and puts you in a position of authority in heaven seated at the right hand of God you cannot earn righteousness all you can do is accept Jesus and then you become righteous through what the righteous act that Jesus did it's a gift you can't earn it so when you realize that and you you kind of keep that in in your in your uh, don't get caught up in pride mode is how do you get lifted up how can you possibly get lifted up with pride when all the tools that you have to succeed in this life were given to you. I didn't earn any of them. I, it's a gift. But at the same time, it's a gift. And I've got the gift. So quit selling yourself short. You've been given the gift of righteousness. You're just as righteous today. Listen, if you go out and you get born again today and you go out and do something stupid, your wife and you have a fight, you treat your kids wrong, you get angry, you get fly off at the handle... You're just as righteous during that feat of anger as you are the day you got born again. Because righteousness cannot be based upon our do's and our don'ts because if it's based upon our do's and don'ts, I don't. And you don't. Can you see what I'm saying? So it's a good thing to me that I can walk around and I can say, I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Well, how dare you talk that way? Well, well, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. Well, if you're a sinner saved by grace, then you're saying that Jesus didn't make you righteous. Now, I'm a righteous person that happens to blow it once in a while, but I'm not a sinner. That's, that's not my nature anymore. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's so important we get this. This is what the whole series is about. See, but our adversary, the devil, wants to keep us in a constant state of insecurity a constant state of reminding us what we did or didn't do. A constant state, because he knows, now look, okay, he's like this. This is his thinking. Okay, look. <laughs> Man, they got saved. Trent got saved. You know, Trent lost two fortunes before he's 30 years old. He's on his third one. You better keep this one, bro. But, so Trent gets saved. So he's like, Trent got saved. Oh, man, I thought I had him, but I don't. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to throw trials, tribulations, I'm going to get him to think less of himself so that now that he's saved, I know he's going to heaven, but he'll be ineffective if I keep him off, if I keep him just thinking low about himself. If, I don't, if he doesn't understand righteousness, if he keeps himself, then I'll keep him ineffective and I, he won't be able to produce what I have for him. He won't be able to dream big. He won't be able to go big because I'll keep him ineffective 
by him constantly thinking about his sin in his life and the sin consciousness that he has in his life. So the enemy's job, and you're, most of you are Christians because you're here on Sunday morning, but the enemy's job is no longer to try to get you to go to hell. That's a sealed deal, man. You, you made Jesus the Lord of your life. Okay, I, 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 I can, if I'm the devil, I, I can see that. You're going to heaven. But how can I make you ineffective so you don't take anybody with you? That's his whole plan, man. That's his whole plan and purpose is to make you ineffective so you can't take anybody with you. So you got this dichotomy all the time and you start thinking and you, you get by yourself and next thing you know, and have you ever got by yourself? And me by myself is not a good thing. I got to have people around me. I got to have the word around me. I got to have something going because I get by myself and then you get these little whispers in your brain. You know, if you were righteous, you wouldn't have done that. If you, if you, if you really love God, you would have done that. Anybody follow me on this? And you got this pull back and forth. It's like these, which one do I believe? But I'm telling you, that's why you have to know the word of God because the word of God will straighten you right out. And the reason why Therese and I have been able to reign in life is because we, we were just not very, we were, we weren't the sharp, we weren't the, we wouldn't be voted most likely to succeed in our, as our, in, in our high schools, you know. But the only thing we had left when we got saved was, God, I give my life to you. Amen. You lead me, you guide me, you instruct me. And if you can make something of this life, I give it to you. And so that's all we've done is just believe the Bible. And now we reign in life and finances and in faith and in marriage and in and healing and, and, and generational things and different things. And I just pinch myself almost like I'm pinching myself going, how did I get here? And it's got to be believing the word. It's got to be I've trusted the word. I, I've been vindicated of my sin. So today, that's my introduction. Today, my message will only be 10 minutes. So... Turn your Bibles to Colossians chapter 2. And this is the one, one word I want you to get today is the word complete. Colossians 2.8 says, Beware lest anyone cheat you. Listen, cheat you. The enemy tries to cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit. According to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world. And not according to Christ, for in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. For you are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. You are complete in him. So, somebody, uh, we got this Red Robin gift certificate. And you, you ever ate a Red Robin burger? And they are, they are of God. Or the devil, depending on if you're on a diet or not. So, so let me see. Who, who, likes, who likes Red Robin over here? Okay. Let me, let me, I'm going to give this to, I'll give this to you guys right here. There's, give, well, you say, oh, well, thank you, but how do you, what are you thanking me for? Yeah, but what if it's 50 cents? Are you still going to thank me? How, you don't, uh, is there anywhere on there that tells how much it is? No, there's not. What's the first question when you get, uh, come on, no, let's be honest. <laughs> when you get, a, when you get a, a, a gift, if it's not written on there, what's the first question you ask? <laughs> come on, are we all on the same page? <laughs> Isn't it interesting that Christians never ask the question? They never ask the question. Well, there's... $50 on there, so that should be enough to get at least one burger. At, at. But he's thanking me because he knows me. It's not going to be more. But it was interesting. Josh was telling me today, um, Josh um, Huseman was telling me today that he got a gift certificate from his work, gave him a gift certificate years ago for, from Burgerville. And so he loaded all his friends up, and he went to the car, and he went to, and he said, hey, this one's on me, man. I got a gift certificate. He went up there, and they said, well, how much is it for? He got all these burgers and everything, and it's two dollars. <laughs> Listen, at Burgerville, you can't even get a swipe of special sauce <laughs> for two bucks. 
Josh spent the next eight years of his life paying off that bill. That is cruel. That's like cruel and unusual punishment. You know, two bucks. I'm not even sure we should thank for that. But how much is in the package? How, how much is in the package? How, how much is in the package? That, well, it's, you know, the Lord gave us 50%. No, he says you're complete in him. You're complete in him. There's a word that I want you to see. And it's called, the word is in the, in the Greek is, is called sozo, S-O-Z-O. And whenever you see the word, many times, not every time, but whenever you look, read through your Bible and you'll see the word saved or salvation. And, and there's so many scriptures, I don't have time to go into it today, but whenever you see the word saved or salvation, where's my, where's my um, oh, here it is right here. This wasn't up here by accident. But, um, so whenever you see the word saved or salvation, Somebody did some packing here. They're going to go on a trip. And, of course, they gave us the suitcase that went out of style in 1953. <laughs> Isn't it amazing, and this was fascinating to me, that we sent a man to the moon in 1969, and we couldn't put wheels on suitcases till in the 80s. <laughs> Do you ever think about that? Sometimes our technology just doesn't make any sense. So, if we just go on a trip, we've got to pack our socks. So we go, I'm going on a trip, I've got to pack my socks. So you say, well, I packed my socks, so now I am complete in him, and my trip is now available, and I'm on the road because I have packed my socks. No. As the crowd roars, No. Well, the word saved is way more than going to heaven. But Christians just look at it as they pack their socks. But the word saved is actually six or seven things that the word saved means. Just take your strongs and cords out and look at it. It's much more than just socks. You've got to get some shoes going on, size 13s. Got to get your extra britches going on. Got to have some of those. What else we got in here? No underwear, thank God. <laughs> got to have your shirts going on because the Lord is more than just going to heaven. His word saved means, I'll share, share with you all the things it means, and then we just feel like we're going to have a really good time of prayer this morning for people that realize, because I hope you're realizing from this whole series that the Lord's not holding back one thing from you. You say, well, man, I just, man, I'm trying to get God to move. Okay, wait a minute. You're trying to get God to move. He, he moved on the cross, sent Jesus to the cross, gave you the word saved, and you're trying to get God to move. I don't know how much more moving you can get than the Lord, than Jesus. Amen? So the word saved, and this is just taking my, Greek concordance out, looking at the word saved, and it means save, it means deliver, it means protect, listen to this, it means heal, it means do well or prosper, if you will, I almost hate that word because we get so weird with that word, but it means to do well in life, in other words, have, you know, increase in our lives. And it means to make whole. Seven things. Save, deliver, protect, heal, preserve, do well, and make whole. So whenever you see that scripture in the Bible where it says, and they'll be saved, just think about that as not just I get to heaven, thank God for heaven, and that's the most important part, but it's much deeper than that. That means I can be healed. I can be delivered. I can prosper in this life. I can have everything because the package is complete because the Lord knows how to take care of his people. Now, I don't mean to be mean about, you know, some of the things that people believe about the earth. And I think this is Earth Day. Is this Earth Day? It's a pretty important day. 
Uh, but it's almost an indictment to me against God to say that somehow the earth is short, that God said, look, I'm going to give you this planet, but it's somehow short of what it needs to be. Everything we need or desire or want is here, and God wants us to steward it, obviously. But the reality is God has provided everything. God's a provider. His name in the Old Testament, one of his names in the Old Testament is El Shaddai, not El Chipo. <laughs> El Shaddai means the God who provides. He's more than enough. He's, he's going to provide for you. So when, when the Bible describes God in his, and he says his name is El Shaddai, that doesn't mean, now listen, and this is important and I, we don't have time to go into all the biblical names in the Old Testament. But when he says he's El Shaddai, it, it doesn't mean that's one of his things that he does. It means it's one of the things he is. It's impossible, if he's El Shaddai, it's impossible for him not to provide. It's impossible for him to not provide. But... Something will interrupt that. Something will stop you from, something will stop your, stop God from providing or stop the flow of blessing in your life. And that's you just saying, Lord, I just don't feel worthy of that. I'm just not, I'm just not worthy. I'm just an old sinner. I just, I don't think I'm worthy of that finances. I don't think I'm worthy of that healing. I don't think I'm worthy of that. And, and, he's, and he's like, hold on, hold on, hold on. It's the, the abundance of grace and the gift of, it's a gift of righteousness. You didn't earn it, brothers and sisters. God placed you in a position so you could receive because he loves you. He's not doing it because you're good. He's doing it because he's good. So in life, I, I just take this position. I'm, I'm not just, I'm not just out, well, if I could just, you know, we, we, we like to compromise. We like to just kind of, we like to just say little things about God. Like, well, all I really want, all I really want, is what you're saying is, I'm going to limit God to that right there. And I say, give me the world, man. Give me the countries. Give me things. Because I want to change people's lives, man. Let's believe big. Let's, let's go for big, man. Let's, let's believe God for big things. Because the Lord's not going, well, I don't think you should have that. I don't think you should rise up and win people to Jesus. I don't want ch countries changed because you might get lifted up in pride. I think he can take a shot on one person to, to change a country, don't you? Classic scripture, last scripture. John 3 and 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but through the world, through him, might be sozo, saved, delivered, prosper. God just didn't send his son to send you to heaven. Now thank God if we, thank God for deathbed confessions and thank God if somebody's going to heaven, just, because they just thank God for that. I appreciate that. This life is so much more. But there's two aspects of it, and then we just want to pray for people this morning. Two aspects of this verse. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That is the sovereign will of God. There is nothing you can do about it. I mean, God sent his son. He didn't ask you. He didn't, he didn't consult anybody. He just said, look, I've got to send my son. He said, that is the sovereign, absolute sovereign will of God. You can't interrupt that. You can't stop the flow of that. That is God's will. And he's put it out there and said, here it is. But the second part of the verse is your faith. He that believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Where are you lacking in your life today? We have no time to go into that word, zoe life. But where are you lacking today? Maybe the worship team could come and we're going to spend just a little bit of time, maybe some extra time in prayer this morning. And I want you to stand. If you're lacking something in your life, you're, you're in a position where you're, maybe, maybe that healing, maybe God, maybe just something chronic has just stayed on your body. And man, you just sat there and you, something chronic and just stayed on your body, a cancer, whatever it might be. And it's just staying on your body. And you just, I don't, I don't know. It's like, and you, you go to the doc, just doesn't seem to come off there. And all of a sudden you start this whole dichotomy in your brain again. 
Well, maybe the Lord, well, maybe the Lord, well, maybe this or maybe that. Or maybe if I didn't, maybe if I didn't yell, if I sh maybe I shouldn't have yelled at my kids. Maybe I should have tithed more. Maybe I should have witnessed. Well, I, I know I was supposed to witness that person. I didn't do it. And they died. Therefore, I don't think I get my heal. Those are the things that go on in our brains, in all of our brains. And I'm telling you, you're in, man, I'm an addict. I'm, I, I'm, I'm an addict. And, and I always will be an addict. Oh, yeah, really? The Bible says you're a new creature in Christ Jesus. The Bible says that you can walk in the power of God. The Bible says you've been vindicated in the eyes of the Lord. Now, it doesn't mean we go back and say, I'm no longer an addict. I'm going to go back and just, you know, sucking on the pipe again because I'm no longer an addict. Well, don't be stupid. But I want you today to think about this rather than just, and I'm going to pray for you, and I want, I want to lay hands upon you. Three, and I'll just lay hands upon you. Prayer partners will be behind you and pray for you. But as we're doing this, if you need prayer, I want you to come in just a second, not now, but we're going to lift up the song one more time. And, but if you need prayer for anything, I want you to come. But I don't want you to come up here. Gosh, I'm going to, I'm, I need to, just say this. Sometimes we just need mercy. Lord, I don't need it. No. But I don't want you to come for mercy today. And that's important. You understand I'm not trying to downgrade that because sometimes we just need the mercy of God. But I want you to come up here as a position of authority that Jesus has made you righteous. In spite of you, Jesus has made you righteous. And not your, you're not telling God what to do. You're not telling God, God heal me because I'm righteous. You're just already telling the devil to take his hands off of what already belongs to you. It already belongs to you. If he didn't spare his own son, how much more? He's not going to spare things from you. What's been hanging on? Depression, a sickness, disease. We'll get this thought, and I'm just ministering a little bit. I'm, I'm actually shorter on my message, so I'm ministering just a little bit. But a lot of times we'll get things like, you know, we were, we're, we were an addict and our body's falling apart. So we'll say, well, I'm just reaping what I sowed. Yeah, you are. But the reality is, let's interrupt that reaping what you sow by the grace of God and the gift of righteousness. Let's interrupt that. Let's interrupt that by grace. Grace interrupts a lot of our stuff. I, I sense this so strong today sense it's so strong today you sold yourself short financially because you didn't think you're worthy you sold yourself short in your marriage because you didn't think you're worthy well of ourselves we're not but I'm not of myself if I was of myself I'd I'd be a I could I'd be a mess what do you need from the Lord